yeah, it doesn't, unfortunately there's a little way of Maya, so I can't really show you real time what I do modeling wise. But, um, you know, for a tombstone, I'd use basic shapes. I'm using cubes, definitely using the cube tool. I'm adding edge loops on it and I'm just kind of extruding it and, and just making it and defining the shape that I want. Um, if that makes sense, uh, use your basic shapes as a starting point. Um, there's a good, there's a really, really good. Um, Here's a preview, we're gonna wait. We're yeah. gonna wait to show this, but this is your first uh, First glimpse of, yeah, of the, of the project you'll be able to, yeah, download and, and, and play I'm with. I'm not gonna it. run it now. You guys will have to wait for the 3D session to, uh, <laughs> to see that happen. But uh, this is it here. So there's a tombstone. So you would, in the case of, uh, let's take, um, I guess we could do the center one here. Yeah. Talk us through what you would do to create so this process. For that, I'm, I'm basically just using three shapes that are all kind of stuck together, right? I've got a hexagonal shape for my bottom platform. This guy there, right? yeah. It's just very, very simple. There's nothing, there's nothing going on on that except for just a simple hexagon shape, right? Hexagon polygon shape. And then from there, uh, on top of that, it's just, a, it's just a cube right on top of that, right? And then I've just distorted the cube a little bit to kind of give it a little bit of a flare. Right, this kind of uh, I see along this kind of beveled edge. Yeah, this kind of yeah, just the, it's all it is. Very very simple shapes, and then on top of that, I'm also using a cube for that for the cross part, and even a little platform lip on the top of that. They're all cubes, right? So that that cross on the top, I just started with a, a cube in the middle, extruded the top, extruded the bottom, extruded the sides to get a really simple cross out of cubes, and then just extruded more to get like little beveled edges and different things, and then you just unwrap it. Yeah. So you kind of take so this is in Unity, which. Yep. I did mention earlier it's not really a 3D modeling tool, but you might take, uh, let's go up. Yep. In, and then you would create, what, another cube kind of? Uh, yeah, or I just create edge loops on that on that cube and then extrude from the different shapes I create just to make, see. make so the shape you need. A little kind of square right here and then you would pull that square off to the side. Yep, and then you, with there you can just run with that. And I think uh, you know the texturing goes a long way, right? So don't think too much on, I've got to have all this crazy detail in the model. Like, yes, if the model's great, that means you don't have to work as hard on the texturing. But if the model is, is simple, right, and let's say you're doing a mobile game and you really need to be conscious of like your, your, um, your verts and your tries and you really need to keep those, those low, what you can do is just really concentrate more on the texturing that you're going to put on those. So for that, I mean, you're looking at, I think it was like, you know, 300 tries total for that whole cross piece. But you know, with the texturing, you can get a lot of leverage and you can get a lot of leeway out of taking this simple, simple model, but adding all these really cool details and, and taking your time texturing it. And, so, and by tries, you're talking about all these little kind of subdivisions on here. Yeah, so Talk yeah. a little bit in the 3D course, but that's Absolutely. the triangles that make this up here. Yeah, tries are just the triangles that make up a model, right? So when you ever hear that term tries, they're talking about the triangles that make up a model. There's two tries in every uh, square in every face basically. So, you know, you're, that's basically all you're doing is you, you want to be conscious of your try count. For me, a mobile games and the mobile games I'm doing, um, I always like to use, you know, this is just my reference, but if I'm, if I'm looking at the amount of tries on mobile devices, I want to target a large mobile device, right? I want to do uh, all kinds of different devices of every speed and whatever, at least like current gen models, right? I always want to target around 30,000 tries, I think, for my baseline of the amount of tries I want to see on the screen at any time. Anything over that, you're definitely going to get the newer devices will run that fine. But I think lower devices, which is your huge audience pool, you know, you want to keep that as like your, your, I guess your guideline. I always say 30,000 tries is like the limit. Um, and then from there, you know, you just want to be conscious on the characters themselves, right? Uh, keep the try counts low. I always like to keep the try counts on my characters. If I have a lot of characters in the game, let's say it's like a hack and slash game and you're running around and all kinds of stuff. I would say I'd keep the try count on each character around 2,000. Not go crazy on that. That's always worked for me and that's just me. Right? That all it depends be, how many of those characters are in the scene. Yeah, too. you could go higher. You know, there's a lot of games out there with these really high characters, but there's maybe only two characters on the screen, so they can get away with all kinds of tries and all kinds of detail yeah. out of just two characters. But if you're doing like a huge epic like RPG style game or a hack and slash, and there's tons of characters jumping in the screen, you want to be very cognizant of the modeling of those characters and the tries that they account because that's all memory, especially on mobile. It's going to fill up that memory really, really quickly. So just some little tips, you know, you want to be cognizant of when you're building your mobile game. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's pretty much my process when I'm doing things. That's pretty cool. I noticed that some folks uh, in the industry, you see that they use a lot of different tricks. Like, uh, let me see if I've got one here. Sure. I don't think I have. We do have a palm tree here. So I can go ahead and place a ton of palm trees on the scene. 
And these look like they're all 3D models, which I just placed 10,000 of them on my scene here. <laughs> That's the awesome button there, mass place trees. I love that. <laughs> so if I was to drop a little character on here and start running around, you would think that it would be incredibly inefficient on here. But uh, one of the tricks used in the industry is called billboarding, which usually will do behind the scenes. So rather than showing you these 3D models, you can actually go in and specify some of the options here. And uh, it will, in turn, basically create a 2D image that no matter where you rotate, kind of rotates with you. It looks like you're viewing a 3D model, but it's really just a, an optimized 2D image. And then as you get closer to an object, it'll show you the full 3D model so you get that full kind of high res detail. So all sorts of little tricks like that to optimize your scene. Yeah, and there's, a, there's another um, like level of detail is another, and I think we're gonna be talking about that when we get into the optimization Tomorrow, uh, yeah. uh, module. But basically, you know, you wanna think about your models too. You can do high res models if it's only gonna be like one thing you're seeing on the, and we're just talking mobile here, right? Yeah. If you're doing PC, <laughs> go nuts, right? Or Xbox or other go things, crazy. go crazy. <laughs> but you know, on mobile devices, you know, you, you really want to be cognizant of, of the, the elements you're putting and the elements you have on the screen at the same time and doing a level of detail, which means, you know, you could do a high res model, like the highest you can, but then maybe use a tool like, um, there's a tool that I use all the time called Topo Gun, where you can bring in a really high res model and then retrace it at a really low, like resolution and low try count, but bake in all that detail from that high res model. So it, it's almost like you're faking what you see, but you're also optimizing. And then you can do different levels of that, depending on if you were doing you know, far up and there's characters in the distance, you could have a really low try count because you're not seeing all that detail. But then as it gets closer, it's actually swapping out different models and you're getting, you know, you're eventually getting that high res model, so. Are you saying we might see some of the uh, topo optimizations in our optimizations module? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> a little hint of some things to yeah, come. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's module six. That's our first module tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow. So yeah, we're gonna do some really cool stuff with that. Amazing, absolutely amazing. But meanwhile, I will I will get um, the Triceratops uh, cy with the cyborg barbarian <laughs> Triceratops alien thing. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. get that finished. We're gonna throw it up um, probably tonight or soon that everybody Sometime can download. In the next couple days, definitely we'll have content. Oh, in the next episodes. couple days, and then yeah. uh, I would love to throw that in a Unity project. Just really simple to show you how we take that create a sprite sheet, take all those elements, and then you can animate them and stuff. I see. So, so even more cool things to come after yeah. this session today. Really, really cool. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, just a reminder, we're going to be taking a meal break. We'll return in about an hour, and then we're going to be covering uh, 3D games. So we'll see you then. Cool. Hello, welcome back to our day of Unity learning session to developing 2D and 3D games with Unity on Windows. I am joined now by another good friend of mine, David Crook, as we talk about this next section, one of my favorite parts. We're gonna be talking about 3D. Uh, I did my intro before, I'm Adam Tulipper. I've got some added info on my slide at the bottom there. If you wanna follow me out on Twitter, I'm always adding tons of cool stuff on there, Unity tips, training, and uh, I wanna mention that I have a four part session on Unity development coming out in MSTN Magazine. Actually, the uh, second one on 2D just ran, 3D's coming out soon. And then we have um, the fourth one on building for Windows coming out next month. So that's enough about me. You are new to this, so welcome for your yeah. first session here. Excited to have you. Tell us about yourself. This is my first MVA session ever. I'm uh, David Crook. I'm a technical evangelist for Microsoft based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, focus on gaming, cloud, development operations. Uh, I'm an ALM ranger um, and did a lot of development operations consulting at various Fortune 100 companies before being a um, evangelist with the uh, Microsoft Consulting Services. You can reach me at the IndieDevSpot.com or also on Twitter at David Crook 1988 um, Very cool. Welcome it. to Module 4, 3D Game Development. I'm excited. Are you excited? I'm really excited. 3D Game Development is one of my uh, personal favorites. It's where the, the scenes come alive, right? What we're going to be talking about today in this module is 3D and Unity, of course. This is the module on 3D. Physics, vectors in Unity, a reading input, creating zombie pumpkin slayer. So we'll kind of uh, take some basic samples, piece them together, and you can understand how the actual final game was created there. Uh, it's still actually a work in progress. We are going to upload these assets to GitHub, and we'll have uh, the assets available through GitHub, and we'll post those links out to our websites in the next couple days. So uh, you can see how everything was done. 3D in Unity. 3D. 
It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 3D is simply X, Y, and Z. Three coordinates. Unity actually has the left-handed coordinate system, so if you hold up your left hand, you can see we've got Y, X, or I should say X, Y, and Z is depth. In other words, into the screen, back out of the screen, that's a Z. Very easy. If you remember uh, high school math, you typically worked in two dimensions with a little uh, uh, graph there. You had X and Y. And now with games and 3D stuff and really fast engines, we now have Z that we worry about. I don't want to say worry about, that we have to our advantage now. I kind of like to think of 3D more like uh, 2D top down just with a little extra component coming up. another way too. Some of my favorite games like uh, the Command & Conquer series, like Red oh, Alert yeah. and, uh, oh yeah, good, good times. Love good times. it. <laughs> Let's start talking first about physics in Unity. The two main components dealing with physics in Unity, rigid bodies and colliders. You don't have physics in Unity without those two components. And as we talked in the first session of the day, they are just simply components added to the game objects. Rigid body and collider. A rigid body is what gives your object mass. Without it, your object doesn't have mass. Gravity must have a rigid body. Your object will not fall if you don't have a rigid body component on there. So mass and gravity, uh, you don't have to have a collider on it, which brings us to next, what is a collider? If you want your object to recognize collisions with something else, you have one cube going to another cube, there has to be a collider. Uh, so without a collider, your objects will just fall through each other. They will understand gravity, but they're just going to pass right through each other because Unity doesn't know how to calculate that. So two main things required, rigid bodies and colliders. So what if I want to have uh, a game with 2D and 3D components? Can I have... Uh the 3D colliders on my 2D or vice the, versa? The 2.5D game? Something along those <laughs> lines, I suppose. Yeah, you know, well, sometimes I see those games where you've got the 2D platformers and the 3D models, or 3D models and 2D. You can mix up, you can mix up colliders. There are specially built colliders in Unity optimized for specific purposes, though. So if I'm doing a 2D sprite in Unity, I want to use the 2D colliders. Uh, I think you can actually shoehorn the 3D ones on top of it and vice versa. But typically, uh, if you're on 2D, you use the 2D version of colliders. And if you're doing 3D, you use the 3D version of the colliders. And we'll look at what those components look like inside of Unity. So let's get to a demo here with some physics and go over to Unity. For this one, I will create a new scene. And this is going to be similar to what we saw in the first session here. But we're going to add a couple more details onto this. I just created a train uh, that has a built-in collider. It's something that we can work with. In fact, if we want to make it look a little bit better, I can just add a texture that's already in this project. And I believe that I saw. So this terrain tool, it comes built in uh, to Unity, doesn't it? The terrain tool is built into Unity. Last year, for the Microsoft Virtual Academy session, I did a whole section on using the terrain tools here to basically sculpt out uh, your environment where you can just raise, do everything that you want on here. Oh, uh, cool. We can even add little stars. This is great. Stars, which is a good mountain shape on here. But let's use this little world to kind of uh, talk about some basic concepts. My mouse will actually click and let me move over here. There we go. All right, let's take a couple cubes on here. First, let's zoom in a little bit more. All right, so let's take some cubes. And got two cubes here. Unity has dropped them right there, which that will work. As it stands now, if I play this game, my camera's probably looking somewhere else. In fact, I can see my camera's looking over here. That's okay, we're gonna switch back to this view. I'm playing my game, I'm gonna switch back to my scene. My game's running. Notice, I have a floating cube right now. Crazy, huh? Yeah, <laughs> who would have thought you could have a floating cube in a world? So Unity, this is simply a mesh with a texture on it, just floating in the sky, um, or shader on it, I should say. Two of them, actually. If we <laughs> want physics, to happen in this scene. What are the two things I said are required? I think it was uh, colliders and rigid, rigid bodies. bodies. Yeah. It. So let's go ahead. Let's move this over a little bit. Oops. So what happens if I leave one of those guys off? We'll show you. We being me in this case. <laughs> yeah, I don't have anything up on my <laughs> box. <laughs> so in this one here, I'm going to do a rigid body. And in this one here, we're going to add a collider. And to your question earlier, uh, what about the different types of colliders? If we look at under physics and physics 2D, under physics, when we add a component, we have all the various 3D colliders. These are the ones that originally existed inside of Unity. 
And you generally use these based on whatever objects you're using. If I'm using a cube, I want a box collider. If I'm using some sort of humanoid or zombie, I want a capsule collider. So you try to choose one that matches. There are other ones like mesh collider, which will wrap the entire shape of your mesh. 